Good morning. Welcome to Bible class at the Granberry Church of Christ. It's really good to be here today, and I'm glad that you've chosen to be a part of this Bible study of the book of Acts. It's been a good journey. I have enjoyed it immensely. We are getting close to the termination of this travel log. Plus, it is, it is much more than just a travel log, but of course, Luke is very involved at this point as, a, as a, an eyewitness of things that are going on. And uh, we'll, we'll see that when we read some text here in just a minute. You'll notice on this opening uh, slide, uh, we uh, have called, uh, titled this study of Acts, Continuing Jesus' Work, and because it's part of a two-volume set that the, uh, Luke wrote for a fellow named Theophilus that he would know the certainty of the things that he had been taught. And then uh, Luke picks that same sort of thing up, though it's not said. The same thing is not said in the introduction to the book of Acts. But it's still addressed to Theophilus, and we're taking Theophilus forward as this great story of the work of Jesus on earth is told. And on this slide, I include before Kings, Acts 9 15, in the account of Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, Ananias, a Christian in Damascus, also received a vision from the Lord regarding one Saul of Tarsus, who had been blinded on the road led into the city by his companions, was at a house owned by a fellow named Judas on Straight Street. And Ananias was told to go there to lay his, hand on Saul, lay his hands on Saul, that Saul might receive his vision back. Ananias, and of course, Ananias had more to say as well, which we will uh, discover this morning. But Ananias had in, initially objected, and the Lord's reply to Ananias was, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of of Israel. And today in our text that we're going to read, it's about carrying the name of the Lord before kings. Let's pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, let your name be praised this day. Let all creation join in in giving you the glory that indeed the creation itself gives to you. We pray, Lord, that as we read this morning about times past and the expansion of your kingdom, the growth of your kingdom, I pray that that will not only enlighten us, but will encourage us and provoke us to continue to be a part of your kingdom coming on earth and your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. We're grateful, Lord, this morning not only for physical sustenance but also for spiritual food. We pray, Lord, that you will find in our hearts a delight, a joy for what you have given us. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for this that uh, goes all the way back to our Lord Jesus, the bread of life. Our Father, please forgive us of our sins. Help us to be people who also take the grace that we have received from you and give it to others. And in times of testing and temptation, help us to be steadfast and true, persevering, in faith, hope, and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn it on. There we go. Paul's defense before the mob was where we started in the previous lesson in the book of Acts. He was in the temple. He was grabbed by a mob of people. They wanted to beat him and kill him. There was a Roman soldier who saw what was going on, who quickly intervened. The tribune who was in charge there at the uh, 
uh, Fortress of Antonia, which was connected to the temple complex, stepped in. Paul was saved from the mob. Uh, he had an opportunity not only to speak, and there is the second uh, account of his conversion on the road to Damascus in that portion of the previous lesson. He was tried before the Sanhedrin, and then there also was the account of Paul's trial before Felix the governor, because they quickly took him, uh, because of a plot against his life, they quickly took him from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And so we, at the end of the lesson, we were at Caesarea Maritima, uh, and we'll see just a word about that here in a minute. But the, the previous lesson kind of ended at this point. Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, and that's, let me, let me say this, the, the, just previous to this, Paul had had a trial before his accusers from Jerusalem. In fact, it says elders came down, elders of the Jews came down, and then they, uh, uh, they employed a lawyer to speak on their behalf before Felix, and they, they made charges against Paul, but nothing could be proved. And uh, Paul was, was exonerated, so to speak, and yet he's still held by Felix. Felix was well acquainted with the way. That's possibly because of uh, his wife, Drusilla. He, uh, he adjourned the proceedings, and then he said, well, I'll collect more information, is kind of what he was saying there. When the commander from... Uh, Jerusalem comes down, I'll talk with him, and then I will decide your case. And he ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs, which would be really interesting to know just kind of how that functioned. It looks like that he was not necessarily permitted to leave the place, uh, the fortress in which he was being held, or the praetorium in which he was being held, although he perhaps had some freedom as long as there was a guard Roman soldier with him. That, that would be a possibility. But certainly there was enough interaction that Paul uh, had, uh, had his needs supplied and he continued to have an influence in that part of Judea. And I would say to some extent all the way to Jerusalem. Although there's no record of, of uh, say Christians from Jerusalem coming down to him. Although we do know that Philip, the evangelist, and his family lived there, and there were other Christians as well who would have been friends of Paul to take care of his needs. Here's where he was. He was right there on the Mediterranean Sea. This was a great fortress, uh, or fortress plus uh, uh, palace that had been built by Herod. That, that portion there is called Herod's Praetorium. But interestingly enough, if you visit this place, you can see very likely the, the area of, of that uh, praetorium and palace where Paul was tried before Felix and Tertullus, and, and later on we'll, he, he's still going to be here in the lesson that we're going to read today, the text we're going to read today. And the Israeli Archaeological Society uh, or National Park System, this is actually part of their National Park System, has a little plaque there that, that uh, contains kind of a key part of the text that we're going to read today. I appeal to Caesar. Well, we come now to the reading of today. Let me see if I can get lined up here. Uh, all right, here we go. We're going to pick up at chapter 24. Four, verse 24, and let me, I wish I had included kind of the list of what I'm going to read to you. Let me just overview where we're going and then we'll get into it. We'll be reading today Acts 24, 24 through 26, 32, in which Felix uh, both detains and listens to Paul for two years, for two years, and then two years later, Felix was succeeded by the next governor, whose name is Portius Festus. And Festus, we will see, attends to, Felix, to Paul's case rather quickly. Both of them, I, I would say the difference between Felix and Festus is that uh, uh, 
Felix, Festus acts more quickly about it and seems to want to settle the matter, but they're both beholden to, to, uh, to being uh, people who want to do the Jews a favor. And then when, when it gets to the point that it looks like Paul is going to be possibly returned to Jerusalem, he appeals to the Caesar in Rome, and then immediately after that, there's going to be a king named Agrippa who visits to uh, seek, and, and, and actually Festus is glad that he showed up because he needed some help with Paul's case, and we're going to read then Paul's defense before Agrippa, which is Paul's last speech in Acts, the third account of his conversion on the road to Damascus. So let's read this portion here. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, who may have been then kind of helped him know some things about the way, about Christianity, certainly about Judaism. And Felix sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. And so here you have the governor of the province and this prisoner in conversation as he had some kind of dialogue with Felix over faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid, and he said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Now, maybe this only happened once. I have the sense, it just seems to me that more than once, because at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently, see, right? It's frequently, and talked with him. And when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. I need to say a word about the, uh, the report that we have here, that Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Drusilla, at age 14, was betrothed to Azizus, the king of Emesa, a Syrian uh, petty state that would be, I think, up around Damascus. According to Josephus, who is our source on what goes on here, she was a, a strikingly beautiful young lady. And when Felix, the governor of this province, saw her, he determined to have her for himself. And so, with the aid of a magician from Cyprus, he persuaded her to leave her first marriage, a marriage in which she was very unhappy, and come to live with him. Now, no doubt there were a lot of gossip in the, among the royal folk and, and the government offices of, of, uh, the, of, of Caesarea, Jerusalem, and other places. Uh, part of it would have been a play on his words. He, pr he promised her that he would make her happy. She was unhappy. He promised her he would make her happy if she would come and live with him. And it so turns out that the governor's name Felix is also the Latin word for happy. So Governor Happy was going to make his new wife happy. Don't you know they talked about that? But look at what Paul does. He talks to him about righteousness or justice. He talks to him about self-control. He talks to him about judgment to come. And this is all under the umbrella description of faith in Jesus Christ. And it's really interesting to me as to that definition of the content of what Paul spoke about here regarding faith in Jesus Christ. First of all, in Felix's dealings with Paul, he did not execute justice. He kind of kept him on a string. He kept him in prison. Felix had actually had the authority to dismiss the case because nothing could be proven. So he could have dismissed the case. And so his, his desire for a bribe uh, kind of overwhelmed any sense of justice 
that he might have had. Self-control. He didn't have much self-control. Judgment to come. Um, he was at risk. And in terms of what Paul was saying to him, he, there were times when he couldn't hear that anymore. How often? And, and I, I have to make one little application, just at least ask the question. How often do we speak to people in terms of the judgment to come? It, and I, I'm not saying that, that that's necessarily what we lead with, so to speak. But should we, should we avoid that? I know it may sound a little bit too hellfire and brimstone to some of us. Are we trying to scare people into Christ? I have to assume that Paul was speaking the truth in love, and that's what he exhorted the church in Ephesus to do. And I would say that it, perhaps it was Paul's love for Felix's soul that compelled him to tell him the truth and to do what he could to lead him to Christ. Well, we go on to what happens with Festus who took Felix's place three days after arriving in the province. So very quickly, Festus goes up from Caesarea to Jerusalem where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. He needed to go see those people. He needed to make a connection with them. He knew that he would be dealing with them a lot and that they were critical to aiding him in keeping the peace in his province, which was very important in terms of his reputation back in Rome and whatever hope he had to continue in that place if he desired to do so. And so he goes to see the chief priests and the Jewish leaders. They requested Festus as a favor to them. Second time we've heard the word. Uh, Felix did them a favor by keeping Paul in prison. Now they're asking for a favor. Would you, would you allow Paul to be transferred to Jerusalem? Because they still had in place an old ambush plan to kill him along the way. That's actually what had prompted uh, Claudius Lysias to transfer Paul from Jerusalem down to Caesarea because of that kind of plot. And you remember back in that lesson, uh, that part of the book of Acts, there were 40 men who took an oath not to eat or drink until Paul was dead. So you kind of wonder what happened to those boys. And, uh, but the plan was still in place. They were going to take advantage of that sort of time. And Festus, being a new person in the region, might not have taken the same kind of uh, security precautions that Lysias had done when Paul was transferred from Jerusalem to Caesarea. So Festus answered, and to his credit, he, he, he's, he kind of indicates here that he's not going to be pushed by them uh, greatly or too much. Because he says, Paul is being held at Caesarea. That's where Paul is. And I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me. And if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. Well, after eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. And the next day, as soon as he got back to Caesarea, his, uh, his the kind of the, uh, the cat, the, provincial capital, uh, as far as the Romans were concerned. The next day, he convened the court, ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. <clears throat> they brought many serious charges against him. Charges that uh, would be something like, uh, he's desecrated the temple, he is uh, leading people away from Jerusalem, and then, you remember, Tertullus tried to make the point that wherever this man goes in the world, there is a riot or there is trouble or, or unrest is stirred up. That would be the kind of thing that would get Festus's attention and they would want to press that kind of charge. 
Uh, and so those were serious charges if they could have been proven. But the text says they could not prove those charges. They were old charges anyway, to, over two years ago. Uh, two years ago that those things had happened. And Paul made his defense very simply in this place. His defense is, I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law, against the temple, or against Caesar. There, I have done nothing wrong in any area of law in, in our world. And so, but notice what happens. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go? So he, he knows that it's not the right thing to do, but he's a politician at this point. And he's trying to do, the, do what he can to have a good relationship with these people, and he knows what they want. And so he, he at least to his credit, it would seem to me, that he asks Paul, he gives Paul, which, which in a, as a... As the Roman leader in charge, I think he's obligated to because Raw Paul is, is, is where he is on the basis of the fact that he's a Roman citizen. So are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Perhaps he thought that if we get back to Jerusalem, we can uncover some more information if there's anything there to uncover, and then we can, then we can settle this. What happens? Paul answered, and listen to the rebuke that he makes of this Roman governor. I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, and you could put in parenthesis, and you well know that they are not true, they cannot be proven. If the charges that these Jews are making are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. <laughs> it's kind of, I mean, right in the governor's face. You don't have the right to do that. And then Paul, though, kind of sensing what is going on and the direction that all of this could actually take, because uh, in a way, uh, Festus could have said, well, I'll show you, I guess, if he had wanted to do that and send Paul back to Jerusalem. Even though, as we should have emphasized in the previous text, he said, we'll go back to Jerusalem and you will stand trial before me, not them. Thus, he kind of implies, I will keep control of this. But Paul obviously is not, um, is not confident in, in anything that would happen, even if it's led by Festus, back in Jerusalem, that that would produce anything to his advantage. In fact, he saw it as a great risk. And so these words right here, I appeal to Caesar. This was Paul's trump card. This was the only way left to him to retain control of the injustices that were being perpetuated upon him. Certainly, Paul would have preferred release and I think that's really, really true. Actually, again, just like Felix before him, Festus had the power and really the legal basis to dismiss all of these accusations and release Paul right there in Caesarea. But he seems inclined to kind of continue pulling this thing along to find favor with the Jews. It, you get the sense that he's going to be just like Felix was about this matter, at, at least in terms of finding favor with the Jews. So Paul has to take control of that, and he does. I appeal to Caesar, which meant 
or that he knew that as a result of that appeal, they would have to put him on a ship and take him to Rome. I think there's some important things that uh, in Witherington's commentary, Ben Witherington's commentary on Acts is excellent. And let me read just a, Paul does not lightly or cavalierly exercise his right of appealing to Caesar. Similar to two earlier instances in which he claimed his right of citizens, rights of citizenship, Luke again depicts Paul asserting his right to appeal before a small, predominantly Roman group only at the point in the proceedings when he could no longer tolerate a course of action that seemed to be, that was being proposed by a Roman official. And that's, that's kind of the direction that, that he was going. He only exercised his right of Roman citizenship under pressure. Because Paul, as we have seen, first of all, was a Christian, a citizen of the kingdom of God. He was secondly, a loyal and faithful Jew, loyal to the hope as he understood it that received from the law and the prophets. And we'll hear that in just a minute. And he was secondly, or thirdly, a citizen of Tarsus in Cilicia, as he says in an earlier occasion, no small city. And so he kind of appealed to all of those things first. And finally, when forced to, he would call upon his Roman citizenship. I think, I think that's really important because I, it says to us, we are Christians first. And that's an important word in our world. Let's go to the next part of the text. A few days later, after this happened, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. Festus said, there's a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. Nothing like blaming the guy who <laughs> held office before you, right? If Felix had taken care of this, it wouldn't be on my hands. And it seems to me that Festus is having a lot more trouble with this than Felix uh, had had other, uh, in terms of understanding what was going on. And, and of course, this, is, this all is pretty early in uh, Festus's administration. So you can tell he's trying to figure out what's going on with the Jews in Jerusalem between this Jew that he had in his custody here in Caesarea. So let me go back. There's a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. And I told them. And now he's kind of, here you get, go back to Lysias, Claudius Lysias, and the letter that he had written to uh, Felix when he transferred uh, uh, Paul from Jerusalem down to Caesarea. Go read that letter and kind of read everything around it, and you'll see that Claudia, uh, Lysias puts kind of the best face for himself on that, and that's what Felix is going to do here. I told them that it's not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they face their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. Uh, I'm upholding Roman law and the way, the way we Romans do things, and he doesn't say a word about trying to find a way to find favor with the Jews. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, which to his credit, he seems to act very quickly on this matter. But I convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I'd expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute about him or with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus whom Paul claimed was alive. Well, one of the things that's pretty consistent in, in Luke's report or record of Paul's dealings with Roman uh, officials, especially, say, from, from Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, all the way back in Acts chapter 18, while Paul was in the city of Corinth and he was brought by Jews before Gallio, uh, uh, every one of them decide this. there's no crime here 
as far as Roman law is concerned. It's all a matter of, as the Festus says, some points of dispute about their own religion. And we, we've actually, the Roman law had granted the Jews the right and the freedom to practice their own religion. And they were not going to get involved with that. As long as it didn't disturb the peace of the Roman Empire, as long as they remained in subjection to the Caesar, that was, they didn't care what went on in, in Jewish religious law and practice. And so it, it's just, for, as far as he was concerned, there, there's nothing for, for us as Romans to get involved with here. Uh, and then he also, it's kind of interesting, and it's about a dead man named Jesus whom Paul claimed was alive. That made me think of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, when Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Here's a Gentile, and to him what Paul was saying about Jesus was foolish. How, how could that be? You know, you well know, when people die, they're dead, and that's it. There is no resurrection of the dead. And uh, so you, you can just hear uh, his skepticism about that. Uh, I think actually the Greek word that's used in this context is it's illogical. It's just illogical that, that anyone could hold to, to that feeling. Well, so he kind of outlined the circumstance of the situation to King Agrippa. And Agrippa, well, I need to, let's read this part of it. And I was at a loss as to how to investigate such matters. I don't know how to investigate these matters of dispute with him about their own religion. Or this, even this matter of, of uh, a dead man named Jesus. I don't know how to do this. So I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there before his charges. I guess that's kind of an inference about his seeking favor with the Jews. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. And so Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. And he replied, tomorrow you will hear him. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room. Remember, we had uh, a little photo of, of possibly where that happened. Uh, entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. Now, just let your imagination go to work there. So anybody who was, or I would say everybody who was anybody in the city of Caesarea showed up for what was going to happen that day. And they just wanted to be, be close, and just to be in the gallery to watch all of that happen. And here Agrippa and Bernice come in with, uh, with their fine regalia and, and whatever, you know, maybe trumpets played and, and all of that as they came in. And then they bring in this prisoner. And so Paul is dressed in whatever clothes the brethren have given him. Uh, I can imagine clothing that was maybe kind of ragged, certainly not what Agrippa and Bernice were wearing. And he's in chains. I would assume at least chains between his wrists, a chain between his wrists, maybe shackles on his feet. And so he's brought in, maybe even chained to at least one Roman soldier. And uh, what a contrast. And, and yet, what, what you have here is that prisoner will rise up in a way to give a powerful testimony about his life with a clear witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody who's sitting there listening to him have no such testimony. And we'll see at the end that they're kind of like Governor Felix was 
They don't know what to say in response. Now, they do have a response. We'll get to that. But in, it's almost as if they are at a loss, and Paul is not at a loss. He knows who he is. He knows why he's there. And he has the presence of God through the power of the Holy Spirit to help him speak on this occasion. And this, then, is the last great speech in the book of Acts. It serves as a climax to all the speeches that we have heard on various occasions before that. Well, um, I kind of stopped in the middle of the paragraph, so I need to pick up at verse 24. Festus said, King Agrippa, so he, here's the kind of the introduction to what's going to happen, starting with verse 24. Festus said to King Agrippa, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man, the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found that he had done nothing wrong deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write. Go Again, go back to Claudius Lysias transferring Paul from Jerusalem uh, down to Caesarea in the court of Felix. And you remember he had to write a letter. He had to, he had to there's a, a letter accompanying Paul that kind of briefly outlines what's happened, why he's being sent there. And that's, that's what uh, Festus is required to do. He has to write down the charges, kind of the, the charges and the disposition of, of the case and what brings it forward and, and why he's being then sent to Rome. But I, I don't know what to write. I have nothing definite to write to his majesty, meaning the Roman emperor, about him, who, by the way, at this time was Nero. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write, for I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying charges against him. Uh, it was, it, that's a great understatement. It was not only unreasonable, it was, it, was, it was illegal, basically. It was the wrong thing to do. If he had done that, it would have made him look inept before his lords in Rome, and he couldn't afford for that to happen. And so Agrippa said to Paul, now the attention is shifting. Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand. Uh, I, I've noted multiple times through the book of Acts how there is always reference to motioning with your hands. I've not really found yet a description, although one uh, as to how that mo what that motion actually was. Whatever it was, it would have been a way of communicating, I am an orator. I am about to speak. Maybe it's this. I don't know. But he made a motion with his hand. Maybe he just raised his hand. He began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today. One of the things I know is Paul is always respectful, except in one case, he spoke harshly to the high priest and then said, I didn't know you were the high priest. And we kind of wonder uh, about, about that response. I, I think it's very possible that Paul, in that occasion, was being a bit sarcastic because he was saying to the high priest, if you're the high priest, act like one. And don't break the law in what you just did to me. Nevertheless, for the most part, Paul is always respectful. I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusation of the Jews, and especially you, because you're well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me uh, patiently. I need to find in my notes here, maybe I can just recall most of this, but uh, Agrippa was actually the son 
of King Agrippa I, and he was the great-grandson of Herod the Great, who had actually built the building that he's sitting in at the moment of this hearing or this trial. He'd been born in AD 27. He was reared in Rome. And as a Jewish king, he found a lot of favor from Roman emperors so that uh, as a very young man, I think he was about 17 when he was awarded a very small kingdom. But because they liked him, his kingdom gradually increased. Uh, he he in kind of over various regions in the northern part of Palestine. He, though, never had control over Judea, Samaria, and Galilee as his father had. The Romans didn't trust any Jewish king to run those regions. So they retained control of it. But the Romans did grant him the authority to appoint the high priest and gave him custody of the garments that the high priest would wear on the Day of Atonement. So at least among Jews, because of that, he had uh, a great amount of, of, of influence. Well, uh, Paul says, listen to me patiently which probably means, no, no doubt, what Paul had to say was much more than we just have a brief synopsis of what Paul had to say on this occasion. I expect he talked quite a long time. That's why he said, be patient with me. I've got a lot to say. The Jewish people all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child. One of the things that's consistent with a, a lot of Paul's appearances before Jewish people is he is always going to uh, give his credentials as a faithful, loyal Jew, uh, even a part of the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. From the beginning of my life, in my own country and also in Jerusalem, this is how I've been. I have been among these people. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors. And so Paul always, he consistently uh, affirms his loyalty as a Jew, that the accusations they're making against him, of course, though all of this now, all of his, who he was as a Jew is being read and understood because of Jesus' appearance to him, because of the way he understood now the Old Testament. Notice, this is the, this, uh, it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. And fundamentally, he's talking about the resurrection. If you want to kind of press down on one piece of this that Paul is going to, to emphasize and has emphasized in previous hearings and trials. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. <clears throat> in other words, I am faithful to the Word of God and what it is saying and what it has revealed to us. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope, the hope that we have in common as Jews based on the Scriptures, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I, I, and I can just imagine, he looked at everyone in the room as that statement was made. I too was convinced. And so he, here, here's the extent of my loyalty as a Jew. I was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did on the authority of the chief priest. In other words, he's also saying, implying in all of this, you can check this out. I am telling you the truth. This is not anything but the truth. I cast my vote against them many a time. I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In other words, to uh, deny the Lord Jesus Christ, to uh, disown him. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. And about noon, 
As I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. That's only found in this account. So, uh, and, and I would assume the, the goat is, is whatever was pushing Paul toward faith in Jesus Christ. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? And the answer was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. So from that point in time, Paul has had this tremendous vision of the, Lord, of the risen Lord. And there's more to come as a result of what happened that day what you have seen and will see. And I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes. One of the things that I note about this account is Paul's, uh, there's a, a theological richness of, of description of what goes on here. Paul doesn't say a word about Ananias. Some of what he is reporting here actually came to him from the Lord through Ananias, as Ananias is going to tell in previous uh, accounts of his conversion. So he doesn't say anything about Ananias. But, but what he's saying about this is, is still the truth. Because what God said to Ananias to say to Paul is from the Lord. And so he kind of just it squeezes the, or shortens the story but, but notice, I, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. That would have certainly a great amount of meaning just for the present occasion when this was spoken. But I am sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. There is a place in Colossians that speaks of the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of the son he loves. I believe that's the way the text reads. You can go find that. But... Notice how Paul talks about conversion, so to speak, here, or, or turning to the Lord, which he himself experienced on that day. His eyes are going to be opened as Ananias lays his hands on him. But his eyes, from that moment on, the eyes of his heart are open to the reality of what God is being said, has been saying to them all along in the, in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And so he, he has turned from the darkness of what he had been doing in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ to the light. He's turned from the power of Satan to God. And that's the kind of thing that he's going to take forward. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That sort of thing, that little phrase there in terms of describing the kind of message that Paul is going to take forward really has a sound of, say, Romans, especially to me, in terms of, uh, of the content of the gospel, uh, understanding part of the content, of the, the heart of what the gospel is saying, sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient. I didn't, I, I, the only thing I could do was say yes, Lord. And so from that point on, from Damascus to Jerusalem to Judea, then to the Gentiles. And again, here's a description, a theological understanding of what was going on. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Just like the Lord himself had preached. Just like John the Baptist had preached. Just like prophets before all of them had preached. The message has been consistent and especially consistent within the Christian context. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God, because he was sent to the Gentiles, some of them just couldn't tolerate that. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. Uh, and, and he's kind of acknowledged the, the political greatness of King Agrippa. But I, I, I'm willing to say this to preach this message to any and all. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer 
and is the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to his Gentiles. That's the heart of the message that Paul had taken all over the world. At this point, Festus said, you're out of your mind. It's folly to this Gentile. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king knows, and so you can see him watching him turn to the king and point to the king. The king knows. He understands these things. I can speak freely with him about these things. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice. It hasn't been done in a corner. We all know about this. King Agrippa, and boy, now he really puts Agrippa. Do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And then these, these words that kind of ring from this occasion. Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Either short in terms of just that one speech and that's going to be his, uh, uh, that, which to, that to which he responds. Maybe, maybe Agrippa was saying, uh, you're going to have to Teach me more to really convince me. But nevertheless, uh, these are words from the book of Acts that, that, that we have heard and heard often. Paul said, short term or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. And there it ends. The king rose. He couldn't let Paul continue. And with him, the governor and Bernice and those sitting with him, and you can just watch them all leave the room. And after they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Lord willing, in the lesson to follow this one, we'll go to that place where Paul will make his appeal to Caesar, we'll go to Rome. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this testimony once again of what it means to go from darkness to light and the gospel truth that is contained in the preaching that was done in the past, the preaching that's done today that leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, God, to be faithful to the call and never say something like Agrippa, but that we're going to say, yes, I believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here, Lord willing. Let's do this again next week.